This is Latter-day Presentations, where we discuss topics and issues of faith for Latter-day Saints. Welcome to part six of our discussion of the authorship of Isaiah for Latter-day Saints. Here we're going to talk about linguistics and anachronisms. Now, when we talk about linguistics, what we're saying is some scholars see in various passages of Isaiah loan words or allusions to later contexts like Babylon using Aramaic or Akkadian textual features as evidence of late authorship. There is a fierce scholarly debate about whether or not textual features are reliable indicators of late dating. And Avi Hurwitz is the leading scholar in the field of linguistic change in Biblical Hebrew. He developed a framework for dividing Biblical Hebrew into early and classical Biblical Hebrew, which is abbreviated as EBH or CBH, versus late Biblical Hebrew, which is abbreviated LBH. Hurwitz has a group of challengers that have published books and papers arguing against his framework. Shalom Paul makes an extensive argument for late dating of Isaiah 40 through 66 based on linguistics, and Paul's assertions are addressed by Rooker and T. Meyer. Here is a sample of Mark Rooker's analysis of Shalom Paul's late biblical Hebrew characteristics of Isaiah 40 through 66. What Rooker did was he took some samples of Shalom Paul's claims for late dating of Isaiah based on textual features that resemble things in Akkadian and Aramaic. And here in this example, he points to one of these items and he says, We may suspect that the construction in 56b reflects Aramaic influence. This feature was widespread in Aramaic, being attested in the biblical Aramaic illustration quoted above as well as in various Aramaic dialects, including Syriac, Palmyrene, and the language of the Babylonian Talmud. Shalom Paul's assertion that the usage of this formula in Isaiah 59.2 is uniquely a sign of late biblical Hebrew for the book of Isaiah is undermined by the fact that the phrase is more prominent in Isaiah 1-39 through than in 40-66, through as indicated, for example, by the following texts. And then he points to a couple of examples. So this is a good example of the debate. You have Shalom Paul. He's probably the most prominent scholar putting forward these linguistic evidences for late dating of Isaiah 40 through 66. But when you actually examine these claims that he makes, a lot of these features that he points to are found in other places in the Hebrew Bible that are not dated late. And also early passages in the book of Isaiah itself. Here's what Rooker says. He says, in spite of the potential late signs in Isaiah 40 through 66, there is a virtual consensus that Isaiah 40 through 66 represents classical or pre-exilic biblical Hebrew. Chaim Rabin characterized the Hebrew of Isaiah 40 through 66 as almost perfect classical Hebrew. As a consequence, indisputable marks of late biblical Hebrew in Isaiah are scanty. On the contrary, Isaiah 40 through 66 is clearly aligned with early biblical Hebrew. Stated differently, Bloch observes that the overall concentration of typologically archaic linguistic features in these books, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Haggai, and 1 Zechariah, is much less pronounced than in Deutero-Isaiah, since the language of Isaiah 40 through 66 does not diverge from pre-exilic Hebrew, it provides no evidence that Isaiah 40 through 66 was composed in the exilic and or post-exilic periods. From a linguistic standpoint, the evidence suggests that Isaiah 40 through 66 was composed at roughly the same time as Isaiah 1 through 39. Here's another important consideration, and that is that when the northern kingdom of Jerusalem was destroyed, Many of its refugees went into the southern kingdom during the time of Isaiah, and they brought with them a dialect of Hebrew that had a very, very strong Aramaic influence. So here's William Schneiderwind, and he says, It is now clear that Jerusalem grew more than fourfold in the late 8th century BCE and continued to expand until the last days of the Judean state. Jerusalem's growth was a byproduct of the rise of the Assyrian Empire, First of all, Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, resulting in the immigration of Israelites to Jerusalem. Think about how this relates to Isaiah's ministry. If this happened during his lifetime, we should absolutely expect to see major shifts in his understanding of things based on these geopolitical events. And 
and with all of these people having a dialect of Hebrew that's heavily influenced by Aramaic, it's possible to assume that that dialect influenced writings in Judah in that time period. Now here is Avi Hurwitz. He says, the study of Aramaic has achieved impressive results in the last few decades. The discovery of new texts reflecting previously undocumented stages in the history of Aramaic has paved the way for a more profound knowledge of the Aramaic dialects and their linguistic history. Naturally, this development directly illuminates the issue of Aramaisms within Biblical Hebrew. For our purposes, it is particularly important to note here the discovery of Aramaic inscriptions dated as early as the beginning of the first millennium BCE. That is the first temple period. Such findings have completely overturned the older view that every Aramaism is necessarily indicative of the late biblical era. This mistaken view, which, as already noted, was especially common among 19th century scholars, was fostered by the absence of written sources testifying to the vitality of Aramaic in the early biblical period. However, since it has become clear from these new sources that Aramaic was widespread and enjoyed high prestige already in the pre-exilic period, it could no longer be maintained that the Aramaisms encountered in Biblical Hebrew must reflect later linguistic usage. Here's Ian Young. Indeed, it is hard to find examples in the literature on late Biblical Hebrew where it is even argued that the Aramaism in question is late within Aramaic. Nor can we demonstrate that such Aramaisms penetrated all varieties of literary Hebrew in the Persian period. Some scribes or scribal schools may have been more open or exposed to Aramaic influence than others. Thus, while the Aramaic sources are valuable, they do not give us direct evidence of any contemporary variety of Hebrew. Finally, we should note an inherent weakness of the whole enterprise of dating language. Even if one sort of Hebrew is well attested in external sources from any particular period, that does not prove that that was the only sort of Hebrew in existence at the time. All it proves is that that was the chosen style for that sort of writing. Here's Frank Pollock. In administrative and commercial contexts, Aramaic would be the preferred language for all persons having business with the government. That is to say, the entire property-owning and professional part of the population. Witness the real estate contracts from Elephantine. And Philip Davies. Hurwitz's theory must assume that in the Hebrew Bible, we have only Judean or perhaps only Jerusalem texts and that these were uninfluenced by the large influx of population to Jerusalem in the early 7th century. Look at this quote from Lena Sophia T. Meyer. She says, looking at the issue from the wider scope of the Hebrew Bible, the issue of Akkadian influence in Isaiah 40 through 55 must be put in proper perspective. First, I would claim that most texts in the Hebrew Bible betray Akkadian influence. It is notable that both Bear and Paul detect similarities between Neo-Babylonian royal inscriptions and Isaiah 56 through 66, a text that few scholars today assume to have been composed in Babylon. Likewise, a brief glance through Paul's Amos commentary reveals that Paul detects a high number of Akkadian loanwords in the book. These two examples demonstrate how relatively easy it is to find verbal and conceptual parallels between a Hebrew text and an Akkadian text of roughly the same age without necessarily postulating that the author resided in Babylon. In the case of Amos, for example, I am not questioning the identification of the cognates. Their occurrence in the book of Amos demonstrates clearly that Hebrew throughout the 8th to the 6th century BC incorporated a number of words from Akkadian, the politically dominant language of the time, either directly or via Aramaic. As to the latter case, Aramaic was spoken not only in the areas of Babylon where the Jewish exiles lived in the 6th century BC, but it was also becoming the new lingua franca of the Levant and Mesopotamia, thus having significant impact on the local languages. Therefore, a loanword that has entered Hebrew via Aramaic cannot by any stretch of the imagination be an acceptable argument for a Babylonian setting of Isaiah 40 through 55. Here's David Carr again, and here he's talking about a problem of circular argumentation in questions of linguistic influence in the biblical text. He says, nevertheless, as those who advocate linguistic dating of Hebrew acknowledge, Hebrew texts that otherwise appear early also contain Aramaic features. 
this has led to lists of various criteria for use of Aramaisms in dating, some of which are circular. For example, an Aramaism is useful for dating if it occurs in a book otherwise dated to a late period, but should be disregarded as an indicator of dating if it occurs in poetry that is believed to be early on other grounds. In the end, S. Colt, in his argument for the use of loanwords for dating biblical Hebrew, concludes that the use of Aramaic loanwords is generally useless because of the relatively close proximity of Aram and Aramaic to Israel and Hebrew. Some forms may be useful for dating, he argues, but only when they are preserved in their Aramaic form correspond precisely to a much more often used Hebrew equivalent and are well documented in Persian period or later Aramaic texts. Even then, he maintains, arguments based on Aramaisms risk circularity and often fail to reckon with sufficient diversity within early biblical Hebrew and the possibility that many originally Hebrew forms of words in certain books may have been modified in an oral written Aramaic primary environment to their Aramaic spellings and or vocalizations. This problem of circularity comes up a lot. A lot of scholars point out the circularity in, in these kinds of arguments. Like biblical text Y should be considered late because it has linguistic features X. And linguistic feature X should be considered late biblical Hebrew because linguistic feature X is found in a late biblical text Y. That's an example of circular argumentation. And we see it a lot in questions around the authorship of Isaiah. And now let's talk about some anachronisms or supposed anachronisms in the book of Isaiah, especially this question of Babylon. A lot of scholars say that the elements of the book of Isaiah that focus on Babylon must be dated late because Babylon was not the world power during the time of Isaiah. That was Assyria. But Isaiah spoke a lot about a lot of other countries that were not the world power during his time. In any case, let's see what John Oswalt says about this. He says, The fact that the first oracle, chapters 13 through 14, begins with Babylon, which was not a world power in Isaiah's lifetime, is often taken to be proof of the late date of the book. According to this argument, the later editors of the book, realizing that it was Babylon to whom Judah fell and not Assyria, inserted this oracle at this point. But the opening lines of chapter 13 seem to have been designed precisely to counter such a conclusion. We are told that Isaiah, son of Amoz, not some later editor, saw this oracle against Babylon. If we grant Isaiah enough perspicuity to know that Babylon was Judah's real enemy, then it is not too much to believe that God could have inspired this oracle, especially since it contains many features that were perennially true of Babylon. Even during the time of the Assyrian Empire, Babylon was the center of culture and civilization in the Mesopotamian Valley, and indeed in the entire Near East. Thus, it is fitting to begin a series of judgments against human power and glory with an oracle against Babylon. Now let's talk about another item that some people point to as evidence of an anachronism in the latter half of Isaiah, and that's the Cyrus Cylinder. Marvin Sweeney says, Second Isaiah displays a number of concerns that point to a context in late 6th century Babylonia at the time of the submission of the city to King Cyrus of Persia. Of course, the first indication of this concern is the identification of Cyrus as Yahweh's Messiah and temple builder in 44.28 and 45.1. He goes on to say, As the famed Cyrus Cylinder indicates, the outset of Cyrus's reign as Babylon's new monarch saw his decree that the various nations that had been exiled by the Babylonians could return to their homelands with their gods and reestablish their temples while maintaining loyalty to Cyrus and the Persian Empire. Although Judah is not mentioned in the Cyrus Cylinder, <laughs> let's just pause there and take that in. Although Judah is not mentioned in the Cyrus Cylinder, Cyrus's decree to allow Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple is in keeping with the announcement recorded in the Cyrus Cylinder. This is some pretty creative wording, trying to establish some correlation between the experience of the Jews and what is recorded in the Cyrus Cylinder. Again, Judah is not mentioned in the Cyrus Cylinder. But what happened to them is in keeping with the announcement recorded in the Cyrus Cylinder. 
Well, that does not indicate in any way that the text of Isaiah was influenced by the Cyrus cylinder. Let's look at what T. Meyer says. She says, turning to more specific examples, it has commonly been argued that Isaiah contains parallels with the Cyrus cylinder, and in turn that these parallels prove the Babylonian domicile of the author of Isaiah 40 through 55. What has particularly captured scholars are the expressions, whose right hand I have grasped, and he called his name, both found in line 12 of the Cyrus cylinder and in Isaiah 45, 1 and 45, 3. To begin with the alleged parallel to Isaiah 45, 1, a mere cursory glance establishes the fact that the Cyrus cylinder does not use the phrase, i.e. cognate expressions of the Hebrew that is found in Isaiah 45, 1. In fact, the verb is nowhere attested on the entire cylinder. Also, the subject and the object differ in the two texts. It is unlikely that this general similarity between Isaiah 45.1 and the Cyrus cylinder reflects a situation in which the Isaianic author borrowed directly from the Akkadian text. Instead, it is preferable to see the similarity as arising from a shared ideology within the ancient Near East, where the specific relationship between a king and his deity is expressed in term of the deity supporting and strengthening the ruler. Furthermore, this ideology is not restricted to Isaiah 40 through 55, but is also attested elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible. And now let's talk about this anachronistic reference to Cyrus and the likening of scriptures. There's an interesting data point that we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls in Pesher Habakkuk. It's a commentary on the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk 1 through 6 depicts the prophet complaining to God about the Chaldeans, that bitter and impetuous nation who had destroyed Habakkuk's hometown. The Dead Sea Scroll Pesher Habakkuk reworks the text to interpret the impetuous nation as the Kittim or the Romans who have invaded the land. So the Qumran community actually modified scripture to apply it to their present concerns. What this means is that reference to Cyrus in the book of Isaiah might actually not have been penned by Isaiah himself. It might be a later edition from scribes who wanted to adapt the text to reflect their present concerns. There is precedent for this kind of modification of texts we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls in ancient Israelite scribal practices. And now let's talk about another thing that some scholars point to as anachronistic in the text of Isaiah, and that is the presence of apocalyptic literature, which scholars generally agree didn't really emerge until during the exile and afterwards. Now here we have Joseph Blankensop talking about Isaiah 24 through 27, which some scholars in the past called the Little Apocalypse or the Isaiah Apocalypse. Blankensop says, before we proceed with the commentary, a few additional remarks on chapters 24 through 27 are in order. I noted earlier that this section is not set apart from the rest of the book by introductory or concluding formulae. Since the commentary of Bernhard Doom and an important contribution by Rudolf Smend, the entire passage, or at least its core components, have nevertheless been known as the Isaiah Apocalypse. If we take Daniel and the Enoch cycle as standard examples of the apocalyptic genre, some features characteristic of apocalyptic are present here, like resurrection of the dead, the abolition of death, and the imprisonment of the heavenly host. But others are lacking. Periodization of history, heavenly journeys, and a systematically dualistic way of thinking. And in any case, much of the section has nothing in common with apocalyptic. There is therefore a growing consensus that this designation is misleading and should be abandoned. Concluding this section on linguistics and anachronisms, we have a fairly simple conclusion, and it is that there are valid counterarguments to quote unquote evidences that are sometimes put forward in the form of linguistic influence or anachronisms. And those counterarguments are produced by other world class scholars. I hope this section has been helpful, and I want to remind viewers that the slides for this section are available for download at Nauvoo Neighbor. Feel free to go get them and use them however you please. This has been an episode of Latter-day Presentations. We would like to remind viewers that our channel represents our own views and not necessarily any official positions of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We hope this presentation has been informative. Our notes for this show are at Nauvoo Neighbor, and the link can be found in the show description.
Also in the show description, we have a link to provide feedback. If you would like to suggest a topic for discussion, or if you would like to contribute a presentation on a topic of interest to you, let us know. Thanks again for joining us.